I was sure when we had cheeseburger, uh, one of the cheeseburger founders a few years ago speak that we would have the highest, that would be our highest kittens per slide ratio. But I was wrong. Uh, I want to do another quick show of hands. How many people uh, have ever used Airbnb? Okay, so we have yet another speaker who needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, I'm really proud to have with us Joe, Z Joe Zade, who is the director of product for Airbnb. Joe. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Joe. Everyone just calls me Joe Bot. Uh, not really sure why. Uh, I am the director of product at Airbnb. Um, I started the company about three years ago as one of its first engineers. And the first thing that really hit me was how international the company was. I was never, I'd never worked on code that had been so international that we had to think about all the different countries we have to push out to. And so I thought today would be kind of fun to talk about, you know, how did we grow internationally? What does it mean to our business? But let's start with an overview of how international Airbnb is. Uh, this, was it. this was us in about 2009. We were in a few, uh, few major U.S. cities and a few uh, major European cities, uh, maybe a couple hundred listings in each of those. In 2010, In 2010 and 2011, we start seeing a bigger footprint all over Europe and all the United States. You start seeing some activity in South America. And last year, you start seeing Airbnb really take off in, uh, in Europe, North America, South America. We're starting to blossom in Asia. So as a recap, we've had over 4 million guests and across 34,000 cities, 192 countries, we're translated in 24 languages and 32 currencies. But the real question is, how did we grow? How did we grow internationally? And I'm going to share with you today a few stories and a few opportunities that we've learned along the way. So, sorry, this is not working. So take, so take a city like New York, the first, the first lesson we learned is that our business has very strong network effects. And so take a city like New York City, it's a very international city. In 2009, we had about 10,000 guests visiting Airbnb. In 2010, we had about 50,000 guests visiting Airbnb. And what we notice is that people are traveling into Airbnb, people are traveling to New York City, they're staying there, they're getting a feel for what Airbnb is, they're having a great offline experience, and they're, they're taking that offline back to their homes. They're, they're, going, they're taking the Airbnb experience back to their homes, back to the countries that they came from, and they're setting up their own listings. And then they're setting up their own listings, and people are coming from all around the world and staying with them, And then they're hosting new people from their cities, and so on and so on. So this is the magic of network effects, that you host someone at Airbnb, people come from all around the world, they stay with you, and then they take it back to their city, and then they become hosts, and new people come visit them, and they come back. And last year was a monumental year for us, where international eclipsed domestic trips for us. Our business is now more international than it is in the United States. And this was a monumental year for us. But it's not surprising because travel is inherently international. And I want to start by demonstrating like a counterexample of this. So think about myself, maybe in San Francisco, I want to hire someone to help me fix my medicine cabinet in my bathroom. I need someone to come over to my house and help me do that. There are collaborative consumption services that do that. Really what matters to me is that someone is in my direct vicinity. Uh, someone is within maybe a one, three, five mile radius. Uh, I don't really care if 
that service has presence in Germany or France. It's really most important to me that that service is present where I need it. Um, what is important to Airbnb is that Airbnb has to be everywhere where you are not. Airbnb has to be in Germany or France, but you don't need a cleaner in Germany, in Germany or France. So Airbnb needs to be everywhere for it to function. Thus, we must be an international company. If you ask us, oh, did we expand internationally because we were successful? No, we have to be international to be successful. And this creates a really interesting dichotomy, is that Airbnb has to be both national and international at the exact same time. So once again, as a counterexample, if I want to tweet in French, that can only be consumed by other people who speak French. However, if I want to host an Airbnb, not only does the site have to feel French, but at the same time, it has to set my expectations that I'll be hosting people from Italy, from France, from all around the world. So it has to have both this air of, of you know, feeling local and also this air of being global. Um, and here's another example. Last, last week, uh, we launched new city guides for Austin, uh, neighborhood guides to Austin. We've taken all the neighborhoods in Austin, we've categorized them, and we've, we've characterized them and understand their traits and understand their personality. And one of the... Um, one of the really important things is like what makes downtown different than South Congress? How do we analyze all of the details of that? Because downtown and South Congress are com two completely different personalities, but those are two neighborhoods that are right next to each other. But then the trick is, how do you translate that into something that somebody from Italy or someone from France or someone from Russia can understand? How can you take the nuances downtown and South Congress and make that palatable to someone traveling from Japan. And that is, that is a fundamental difficult challenge and one of the things that we have to do to make that happen is that we can't just take that text, plug it in a Google Translate, hit a button and just make it work. What we have to do is that we have to hire writers that can reinterpret that editorial content and make it feel extremely local. So this starts to highlight what is really a fundamental challenge with Airbnb, which is, uh, or a fundamental challenge of working on any international product, um, which is I am always going to be limited by the fact that I think like an American. I think like an American, so it's always going to be really, really hard for me to think like someone from Germany or think like someone from France. And so the fundamental challenge to me is to stop thinking like an American and start thinking more like a global citizen. And I can illustrate with some examples. This is a, this is a graphic that accompanies one of our wish lists. Now, our wish lists, we've curated some like editorial wish lists. On Airbnb, you can stay on boats, you can stay on houseboats, you can stay on islands, you can live out your 10-year-old ten, uh, dream of uh, living on a train, living on a caboose for a day. And so here's a graphic that really represents uh, our brand and it says, choo choose these trains. And it's, it's a nice little pun, and it also speaks to our design, design aesthetic. We've spent a lot of time on great graphic design. But how do you translate that? Um, if we send it to a translator, it might come back looking like something else. And I don't speak very much French, but this doesn't look right to me. Um, I don't think that's anything about a train. So we might try again, but even then, if, even if we keep translating it and translating it, I never really have the context to know, did we capture that message accurately in another language? And when you start talking about other, like all the complexities of other international languages, I may not have enough context to know that if I have a completely foreign character set that I don't understand, am I even using the right typeface? Does that make sense? Does that convey the same feeling? And then I have to do this across many, many different languages. It's an enormous amount of complexity. So that's, but what I, want, what I want to get across is that you don't have to start that way. That's not how we started. When we first started, um, we, didn't, we, didn't, we weren't able to solve all these problems. When we first started, we just watched what our users were doing and we adapted. So I'll give an example, our payment system. 
When we first launched Airbnb, there was no payment system. When our, uh, when our CEO, Brian, was staying on Airbnb at South by Southwest in 2008, he was writing checks by hand and handing it to, and handing it to uh, the host. And that's kind of awkward, right? Like, like you have a great experience with somebody and it's like 10 p.m. ready to go to bed and like do I, do I pay you now? How does that work? And so what we did is we, we put our first payment system in and that was just to accept U.S. credit cards. So we started accepting U.S. credit cards. Then we started noticing that international activity that you saw early on. And then we started noticing that, you know, that international activity is happening. Well, how can we quickly address the needs of our international user base? Well, it turns out PayPal is pretty good. I mean, we all don't feel great when we go to a checkout page and the only thing is PayPal, but it got the job done and it met the needs of our users at the time. And then we could buy some more time to start rolling out accepting international credit cards. And it's really important to continuously be observing your users, continuously be seeing what they're trying to do with it. Something else that we noticed recently, uh, a few months ago, was during Hurricane Sandy, some of our hosts were setting their price to $10, which is, the, which is the lower limit of what you can set your price on Airbnb. And they wanted to host their place on Airbnb to uh, displace Sandy, Hurricane Sandy victims. And they were charging $10, and the description says, I will refund you the $10 when you arrive. Well, we said, well, we can iterate on this, and we can make this happen. What we were able to do in a matter of hours is have our payment system support $0 reservations. And if you ever go to a payments team and say, hey, you know that fundamental thing your, your team is supposed to do, which is accept money? Can you actually violate that logic and accept no money? And that actually ended up being really successful in the sense that 1,400 hosts over the next couple of days were able to open up their homes to Hurricane Sandy victims for free. But bringing it back to international, what we recently learned was one of the barriers our translators were having to getting through all the flows was that they didn't want to put their credit card information in uh, on the last page of the checkout flow. I mean, we couldn't uh, ensure the translation quality of what follows the checkout flow. And this solution ended up being also a way that we can improve the quality of our, improve the quality of our translations for places where payment is required. And one kind of on the thread of doing good, if you're working at an international scale, you have the ability to do good for the world at an international scale. Um, so one thing we've noticed is that you take a city like San Francisco, take a city like New York, it has a lot of international travelers coming in every year, millions of international travelers coming in every year. And where do they go? They go and they stay in hotels. They stay in hotels in the Tenderloin. They stay in hotels in Fisherman's Wharf, uh, downtown. None of these are places that I actually want to go. However, with Airbnb, and I really hope this works, with Airbnb, we have listings everywhere, everywhere in the city. And we can now bring tourism dollars to neighborhoods that don't normally get it. Uh, we can bring tourism dollars to Bruno Heights, and these are very authentically local places, and we can bring tourism dollars to local coffee shops, and not necessarily just uh, chains that are downtown. And when we did a study, last year alone we brought $56 million to the city of San Francisco. These people are spending more money, they're staying longer, and, uh, and they're having a better time because they're in a much, much more convenient spot. And this also allows us to really bring the world together. Um, one thing we've noticed is that we're, when, we, when we look at Facebook connections before and after trips, we've noticed that we are creating cross-country friendships, uh, cross-country friendships at a much higher rate than domestic friendships. I mean, I mean, really think about that for a second. Like, how often are you adding Facebook friends or staying in touch with people that are com from completely different countries? And so we're really, really proud of this. And it seems like that's only accelerating. But I, I think one thing that, I, that dawned on me maybe last year or so was I was, I was struggling to like solve international problems because there are no silver bullets. There's no payment system that works authentically in a local way all around the world. There's no, there's no natural form of international trust between people. There's no translation framework that works really well. This is a really, really ripe area to be working in to help bring the world together and one thing that dawned on me is that when you don't see a silver bullet, 
that is an opportunity to become a silver bullet. And I think that's what Airbnb has done. For example, we, we can offer long-term stays and long-term stays all around the world. And if you wanted to, to rent a place in London or Japan for three years, where would you go? There's no silver bullet for that. But Airbnb, by sitting in between all these different international cultures, we can become the silver bullet. So the advice I give to people in this room as entrepreneurs is look for opportunities to be the silver bullet. So thank you. So I have time for two questions, I think. Yeah. Really quick. Um, has everybody can hear me in the room, can they? Close enough. Oh, sorry. Um, just in terms of the early years of Airbnb, I'm a great fan of this product. I use it all the time. I travel around the world with it twice, so it's really just something fantastic. But I would like to know, in the very early days when you're based in New York City, how did you kind of deal with the network effect and actually get, get, get people to get it together? Because I certainly find a lot of the network, network effect businesses, it's very hard in the early days to find scale those because obviously yeah, I mean, the chicken egg problem is, is a very challenging problem. Uh, I think the thing that worked most successfully is that when you did see people uh, engaging their product, you really, really went, you went and you met them. You went and you sat down with them. Our earliest hosts, we went and sat down, helped them understand their listings, helped refine the product, and helped them deliver a great hospitable experience so that when you do have someone that comes and visits, they have such a good experience that they're taking it back with them. So it, I think it's just providing a superior experience to your first early adopters and treating them like royalty. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thanks.